理解するんです。目の前で西川西川の中央で、それまでパーティーのリスイベントは、コースコンサートバイザーのアバカリスのパーティーです。And tonight we do have a special guest, Larry Gapkan, he is a professor in Americas, and also one of the co-founders co -founders of this cinema department. But before introducing、uh, Larry Gapkan briefly, I would like to mention we are going to have one more event this semester. And Alex, could you change the next slide? Thank you. Great, thank you. So, we are going to have another event on Zoom.、Uh, today, we are going to watch one program of films by Larry Gutheim. And this Thursday, we are going to have another event on Zoom. And we are going to show another program of、uh, films by Larry Gutheim. So, if you can join, please join us. And you can find the Zoom link on our website. Thank you. And, Alice, could you change to the next one? So, Larry Gutheim, he taught here at Binghamton so many years, and I believe he has taught classes here in the Chow Six. So, welcome back, Larry Gutheim. And、uh, this is our great pleasure to have him back、uh, since he retired, I believe,、um, the mid 1990s, I believe. Yeah, probably、uh, Larry can correct. Virgin、so, 1998. 1998, so it's more like a late in. Uh, Larry Gutheim,、um, when he established this、uh, cinema department in the late 60s to early 70s, that's when he started filmmaking.、Uh, he started filmmaking and he has created an influential body of films, and he's one of the key figures in the American avant garde and the cinema. cinema. And I'm going to、uh, tell you where he has been showing、uh, his films at、uh, numerous film festivals, and I'm going to list a few of them,、uh, such as New York Film Festival, International Film Festival Rotterdam,、uh, Tribeca Film Festival, International Short Film Festival Oberhausen, Havana Film Festival,、uh, Experimental Film and the Video Festival in Seoul in South Korea. And also, he has shown his films at museums and Other art and screening venues, including、uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York, Whitney Museum of North American Art, Museum of Moving Images, Paris Museum of Modern Art, Pacific Film Archives, Anthology Film Archives, Harvard Film Archives, and Goya Film Archives in Belgium. I could call it、uh, the more uh, Munich uh, Film Archive and Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, a Museum of Sorry, Manson William Cochran Institute, LA Film Forum, San Francisco Cinematheque, and many, many others. And his films are in collection of、uh, Pacific Film Archives,、uh, Carnegie Institute, Museum of Art, and Moderna Music in Stockholm, and Donnell Library in New York City. I also want to mention that、um, one of his films,、um, Folkline, was part of the DVD set. A、Treasures for American Avant Garde Film 1947 to 1986. And also, he has published another DVD, Larry Gutheim Folkline, which includes seven films by Larry Gutheim. And he has a copy of these DVDs, so if you are interested in after the screening,、uh, you can、uh, purchase from Larry. And also, I want to mention that、uh, Larry is going to publish a monograph about.、Um, His practice of filmmaking in the last maybe five, six decades. And the title is The Red Thread, which is named after one of his films made in 1987. And also, I want to mention、uh, a few weeks ago, he had a tour and showed many programs at、uh, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, University of Wisconsin,、uh, the Madison, Chicago Film Society, and Northwestern University. Uh, where he also conducted a m a s t e r class with、uh, the students. And also, finally, I would like to mention, and Alice, could you change the slides? Thank you. Yes,、uh, he has a wonderful website. So please check、uh, because it has information about 
not only his films, but also how he kind of, uh, categorized and divided into certain parts of his practice. And you can find the website narigattimefilms.com. OK, Alice, could you change the slide again? Thank you. And now please join me and welcome Larry Gattheim. something special uh, to begin with uh, because it's a film that I made with students here. Um, th there's been a history of faculty student work at the internet. I'm, I'm sure there's still things going on after I left, but uh, Ken Jacobs had this sort of shadow play uh, performance. Nicholas Ray, as you probably know, made a film here with students, and I made this film and another film also was part of a teaching thing that became a common creative work. Now, I don't want to talk a lot about it because um, I'll just give you a little introduction and then we'll show my last two films. Uh, then we can see uh, I've recently become uh, enamored of going directly to the A and skipping the Q. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, we can see how it goes. It's just sometimes you know, obviously, I would love to talk to all of you at length about the films, but um, I'll talk about them at the end. So now the film that we're going to see is called Natural Selection. And uh, almost everything in this film uh, that's visual was shot by students. Uh, so it was their introduction to uh, sync sound filming um, and other aspects of performance. And uh, an important part of the work was that the development of the concept of what would be included in the film was something that was uh, done with the students. We met every week and uh, for almost a year and uh, went into different pathways, as, as you'll see. But I just want to point that out, that um, I edited it and did a lot of sound work in it, so I include it in my films, but I want to honor this place and the students who helped with this film. Okay? So. stuff here, I know it's heavy. Interestingly, um, this juxtaposition of the first film and these last films made me see the connection and it sort of makes sense as a, as a program. It's a lot to absorb, there's a lot of information and physical things to see and experience, sound. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to ask you specific about the, something in the last entanglement. Uh, there's a clip you use quite often of several people on the line being held at gunpoint, and while like um, I do see many ways that could fit the large scope of the film, I was just wondering like the origin of that clip. And could why you speak I, a little louder? No, of course, yeah. Of the entanglement, you used a clip of um, several people being held at gunpoint, uh, walking across the street. Um, I was just wondering uh, the or like what the significance, origin, the story behind that clip is, and it's sort of you know part in the larger film. Okay. Well, the film to me, uh, one way I think about it is it's like every shot, every element is like something where if you touch it, it blossoms out into this big flower of associations and thoughts and interpretations. Um, or sometimes I think of it as you dive into something. Um, but there's a, that's a very important, thank you for talking about that. One, one thing is uh, the line 
for some reason, uh, my, one of my first films, uh, and I have this DV of clues that, is called Fog Line. And there's a kind of um, contrast. Anyway, the world of fog is different from the world of line. And ever since then, the idea of line and rope and so on has um, found its way into uh, my, uh, my films. And I can't say that there's one specific meaning. But in the previous film, um, there's something that's a very major element um, is this line uh, that, that then it turns out to be of people marching behind a fire. And that's actually um, the students burning books in uh, Nazi Germany. Um, but that line um, was very important in that film. And uh, actually, uh, when we were working on it, um, some, something made me think of something that I had filmed uh, in Pearl Harbor, um, where look down into the water, and what you see is the, um, the sunken uh, battleship Arizona. Um, and I remember that there's this kind of squiggly line in there. So I went and found that footage, and I was also looking for a footage that had these holes in it that was sparkling all, all throughout. Um, um, but anyway, that led to, um, to the idea of the line. And then entanglement, um, something that I feel is important in my work is what I think of as acceptance. Like things come into my, somehow, either things that I already shot or things that I find, as in these last films on YouTube, uh, somehow. Uh, so that actual thing was uh, from this first uh, atrocity uh, that was found in liberating this town of Bucha in um, Ukraine. Uh, but it also has a kind of uh, echo of what we think of as the Holocaust. Or it's, something, um, it's something very uh, dark, but yet it's also very fascinating. It's very beautiful in a certain way, just, just like the line of the book burning, uh, when it's with a certain p part of the music, it's like that's how sound and image should be. To me, it represents a really, I'm, I'm thrilled to have discovered it, of the way that the music is sort of beautiful over this really horrible sound. And the same thing um, with the line of, of prisoners, it's almost like they're dancing. And there's a kind of puddle that they go past, and the, their feet are reflected in the, in the um, puddle. Um, so there is this juxtaposition of beauty and uh, horror, I mean, to make it simple. I mean, but, um, and that's also uh, very present in uh, this documentary film about the uh, conductor Wilhelm Furtwängler. Um, I've been interested, you know, always, I started studying music, and I'm always interested in musical performances by different conductors. Um, the, the, uh, the, conduct, the figure of the conductor has been important to me uh, because the conductor is, in one way, representing control. And, and I, I watch a lot of performances of uh, conductors, conducting orchestras, of the same piece. Uh, it's one of the things about classical music is that there are many, many, many different recordings or performances of the same thing with kind of subtle differences and the conductors bringing those out. So in some way, the conductor is, um, and, and um, Fort Flingler was a really great, great conductor. Um, but, but it also is a person of control, um, of a certain kind of mastery, uh, and that is the kind of issue that's been important for me uh, in my own life and in my work, uh, trying to uh, define my work coming from me, how that differs from other films that have been very important to me and are major parts of the, um, of the past 
uh, experimental film thing, although the future of experimental film is in your hands here. Um, uh, and I'm already kind of, uh, I mean, I'm excited to see like new work because it's very, very promising. And I, I rethink some of the work that, that has been important to me. But anyway, in my own life, there is this element of um, passivity as, as well as, of course, creating films like this is not passive. So that there is that kind of ambiguity um, in that line of, of the prisoners. Um, it's, you could never get to the end of it. And again, I don't mean to say that that's how you should think about it, because um, it's very uh, stirring. I mean, a lot of the things in these films are, they stand out um, in your memory or in your experience as touching something. Uh, sometimes you can't put your finger on, <coughs> on expression, but anyway, uh, put your finger on what it means. Uh, and I have that same, um, I have that same issue. I was thinking on the bus today uh, about dance. Of course, that is kind of has a dance like, but even though I was, it was very important to have the, the dance element in the film. The last thing that's said by the, um, the pianist Corton uh, is about um, uh, dance, about, about music, about um, waves washing over, about dreaming. That's what I wanted to get to, is that um, there's a thing about dreaming. And one thing that's very ambivalent, when I started to work on that film, um, I was, again, my life has been somewhat restricted, so I spend more time working at home. And so when I'm too tired, I turn on the computer and watch stuff on uh, YouTube. So I, something came to me from a childhood memory of this Phil Spitalny and his all-girl orchestra. And so I, you, the thing about YouTube is you can put anything you think of in there and it'll bring up um, material about that. So when I saw that opening thing, uh, I was, it, it seemed like the stupidest thing I ever saw. I mean, it's, it's so, um, it, um, it goes into so many areas that are wrong um, or, or that are stupid or have a lot of problems about them. But what I found, so I, I had this feeling like, okay, the challenge is that's going to be the basis of my next film. This thing that I hate and I crack up when I, when I watch it. Now, over time, uh, as I um, uh, became more and more involved with the film and with the material, I followed some of those other Phil Spitalny things. Um, and uh, the thing that we hear at the end, or the last part, uh, where, where she's singing, uh, there's no more dreaming. Uh, and it's somehow very beautiful. I mean, that the same grotesque um, material of this crazy orchestra actually creates something really beautiful. So it's kind of the juxtaposition, again, in the same thing of, um, of, of something beautiful uh, as well as something terrible. And so when it ends with this thing of dream and maybe death, and it has so much reverber reverberation for me. So maybe in answering your question, um, I'm giving you my sense of the film is that everything is related. Like if you ask any question of anything in it, it um, not only um, opens up, as I said, like a flower, but it also um, becomes connected with other things in the film. Um, so that one of the things that's become uh, over time uh, very, very important in all of my work um, is this um, importance of memory. And just like the word dream, the word memory uh, is not a simple thing. It doesn't just, oh, 
memory. It's uh, in all of uh, human life, uh, th those things are uh, thought about and very important to people. But memory functions in, the, in my films uh, as something that's part of viewing the film. In other words, you somehow, you, you happen to remember something. That's part of the idea of having the last section repeating mostly uh, what's in the first section is that it's different, it's the same, but it's different. Um, so I, I could go on, but, uh, and I've written a book about uh, my life and my films, uh, but I, I don't have the answer. I mean, it's puzzling to me that um, often what leads me to do something is like I just told you, I see this stupid thing on uh, YouTube and I think it's ridiculous and I say, um, I want to use it. And I try to think, what, what is it in me that um, made me turn to that as the basis of the film? And uh, I realize that I don't know uh, because there are things, and the idea of dream uh, came up to me uh, in that memory in the films functions something like the experience that we've all had, and certainly I have it, is when you wake up and you realize that you've just been dreaming, and you try to think, oh, e even if it's a frightening dream, you, you, you want to get into it. I mean, you wish that you could repeat it. Being in the world of the dream is pulling you into something, but you can't get hold of it. it. It either disappears very quickly, or for me, sometimes you get a little flash, as though, oh, maybe I'm going to get back into that world of the dream, but it, it's gone. You, you, you can't find it. I, um, I have a film called Mouche Volant, which means flying gnats, that has to do with um, uh, uh, a optical phenomenon where you see these, or, not, or somebody who has this condition sees these spots dancing in front of them, and that there's a desire to kind of follow them, move over, but because they're inside your eye itself, uh, as you turn your eyes in that direction, they go in that direction. You could never, um, you could never find them, uh, and that has a kind of very strong um, it's, it's very strong experience, so that memory has a little bit of that connection. So I suppose something like the connection of dream and memory and so on is um, there. What's really great that happens uh, more now, uh, and I'm so grateful for it, is to be in a sort of zone uh, of sharing with an audience I mean, it's really, um, of course, when you work on a film, you're the audience. I mean, you're just making it um, by yourself or by the people uh, that you're working with. Um, but to actually be in a room of one of people all zoning into the thing in different ways. Everybody's remembering it differently or associating it differently. Um, and that's very powerful. Versus? Yes. I, um, I'd like to hear a little more about entanglement, too, please. I, I, you were speaking about mastery and uh, the conductor, uh, but uh, the film is also talking about uh, resistance uh, to our, uh, the conductor in, in those great little uh, uh, electrical uh, video shorts. So um, that uh, really implies, uh, to me at least, that there's <coughs> Well, something that's very complicated, uh, and I was also thinking of that today, is uh, in my book, um, the book ends, uh, each chapter is kind of centered around one of the films, so it ends with not not. And, I, and actually, uh, the person I was working with thought that as he's like, makes his last conductor thing, that was me uh, saying, this is the end. 
Um, so it was like such a gift because I kept feeling, all right, maybe it is the last film, but I don't want it to be the last film. And so it was like a miracle when, of all things, um, you know, some of the things that I was finding out of my own interest, like I never really, I loved a lot of Wagner's uh, for uh, opera things, uh, but I didn't know uh, the last one, uh, Greta Demeron, or the Twilight of the Gods. So I was watching that, and I was amazed to see the translations all talking about entanglement. And entanglement actually is one of those things that also has a completely double opposite meaning, because in um, quantum theory, and that's why I felt that something like you could see how co closely not not and entanglement are connected, not only through the importance of the conductor, but in many ways. But I felt that coming upon this idea of entanglement in quantum physics gave me an insight into my previous films that I was not, it opened up another way of seeing everything. So I felt that even though those two films are really connected, one is before and one is after. So what I'm hoping is that I could do, uh, I mean, I'm starting to have an idea of another work, and God knows what that's going to be like. But, um, uh, but entanglement is very, just to talk, say a little bit about it, I don't want to get into physics lecture when I'm such a, you know, not a physicist, although science has always been very interesting and to me, not, not just within it, but as, a, as an idea, as a human endeavor, uh, science is problematic. Um, okay, I lost. Oh yes, so entanglement originally comes about with the idea that in these um, collisions of particles, there could be like a photon or some kind of particle, and all of these things are, nobody knows what a particle is, but if it's um, struck by something else, it breaks out, and so out of this one particle, there are these two things in the simplest form, and that what's important is that um, these two things are now entangled, which means in that context that they have some kind of mysterious connection with each other that probably has to do with knowledge. And they could be as far away from each other as in another galaxy. But if you were able to look at this one, you would know something about that one. And that was a big issue. Uh, Einstein, or now I saw that somebody, this woman who talks very brilliantly on television, calls him yeah. Einstein. Um, but, but anyway, um, he hated that idea that there could be some kind of a connection over great distances when there was nothing between. Um, and so he said, that it must be incomplete. They must, there must be something that's happening. This is really very trivialized st statement about it. But these guys that won the Nobel Prize uh, just last year, what their project was, was they had an experiment that proved that no matter how weird this idea is, that's how it is. I mean, they demonstrated that uh, somehow. Uh, so I find that really very powerful, and I'm thinking about it a lot. But now, if we, if we just look at the subtitles of the opera, uh, what's happening, these are the three norns who are spinning the rope of fate. Uh, uh, and what they're saying is that it got entangled, meaning the opposite of connected together. It's, dis it's disconnecting, it's fraying, it's breaking. So that uh, I like when words also have these uh, multiple meanings. So entanglement both means some kind of connection, link, something, but also the breaking of some kind of a thing which is a rope or a line or whatever. 
sorry to go on so much. But, but I think that um, the way that your question just opened up all this stuff is an example of what I'm, what, how I myself experienced the, the film, so that we could take anything else and question it, and it will start to. S somebody wanted to? Yes. I was very fascinated by your film, Not Not, and I was wondering um, what was the inspiration for it? Well, again, this idea of acceptance, um, there was two things, or several things, that were very <coughs> separated and existed only as things in themselves. One of them was, um, a lot of my early films dealt with the world around me of nature and um, you know, I was even put in this category of nature films which I didn't really want. But um, anyway, now I'm living in a place where um, there's brick buildings. Um, so I was walking just down the street and I saw in this crevice of, uh, between two buildings this uh, thing that, that, that's a, a um, silhouette maker. Um, it, I thought it was originally made by some local person, but it was made by a silhouette artist who had been invited to do these different things in different places. So what it shows, so first of all, I was confronting something of looking at the opposite of something like the open space in fog line. It was the brick wall. Um, and the, the, what it was depicting was from the back, the back of a woman with somebody else on her back facing the wall and right, right, I'd written something on the wall. And then what fascinated me is that what, what was written, you could make out, was Les Enfants Terribles, uh, which is a play by um, Cocteau, uh, The Terrible Children. Um, and it's crossed out. There's a, um, a different kind of artwork made from a spray, hand, spray can, like we see a lot of graffiti. It just goes across the words. And um, that fascinated me a lot. And the idea of erasing is an important idea, and it also pops up in uh, philosophy and film theory and stuff. Um, but um, I wondered whether that crossing out was really part of the work, which was really far out. I thought, wow, you know, somebody actually did something that's so complex. I later learned that it was somebody else who had done it, because I went by it one day, and the, the black graffiti was um, removed, but the idea of graffiti on top of graffiti was important. So anyway, that was one element that I, f I wanted to, I started filming it as a separate thing, just wanting it. Um, the other thing that's important was um, I became uh, close to this woman from <coughs> Spain who was a, a avant-garde uh, composer, and she had sent me uh, these, one, these, these links to her works, and there was one work called Friday. I don't know why it was called that, actually, but I, I decided that I wanted that to be the structural basis of, of the film. So those two things were the main element. Uh, some other things um, came into it. Um, I'm not quite sure how, like I told you about the, the, these things that I had for many years before, uh, from Hawaii, from Pearl Harbor, uh, looking down at the ship. And what happened with that was over time, because it was really kind of a long time before, it had turned this red color. And I decided to use it like that. So again, th th these things, which were really quite separate, started to come together. And that, that's sort of the origin of a lot of the things. Um, somehow the idea of superimposition has also been interesting, and that's in the last two films in different ways. Um, I, 
I think that way of making films is, um, in some way, is a kind of passivity. I mean, it's like a difference from, let's say, most documentary films, even great documentary films, are, um, they want to teach you something. They want to show you something. Um, and they address you in different ways. There's the whole history of um, th those kind of films, but what they all have in common is this wanting to teach you something. Uh, and also to think about the relationship between an audience and the film in a certain way that allows them to think that they're teaching you something. Um, this way of, of making films, even though I'm using documentary material, is different. It's relating to the audience in a different way. And um, I think I'm not trying to teach you something or it's, it's related to you. Um, I, I have a film called Tree of Knowledge in which the, inside a documentary about paranoia, in which there's one little cut from that in this film where he says everything is connected and then there's a cut to the film where saying it's all connected. Um, but inside that there's, there are little scenes from a um, doc children's documentary film about the, the seasons. And um, anyway, in that film it has a lot to do with this issue of um, like knowledge Um, quantum physics has a lot to say about knowledge. Also, even in entanglement, there, there's an element of knowledge. When they talk about it in a simple way, it's like if you look at this one, like you, you get knowledge about this one, then you would get knowledge about that one. Or, or although you won't be able to get that knowledge until you open it up. Um, I mean, that's this thing about that diagram that I love. I think about it, like a snake diagram um, is, um, anyway, when you look at that one, in, in between the two things, it's at the same time, both of the states. Like, you know, they give the example which they do in simple things like spin up and spin down so that if, if you know that this one is spin up, then you know that that one is spin down. So it has something to do with knowledge and so on. And go on, and on. Yeah. Sorry, could you speak a little louder? Could you oh, move? sorry. Uh, so, in the last film, you were using that tape from the uh, gunman, like, leading the, leading the line, which you said was, like, kind of dancing kind of thing for you, the line. So, it really made me feel like think that why did you decide to use exactly that tape when there was, like, war going on in uh, Ukraine at the same time? And you made the film in like 2022, which was the exactly same year the war was like starting, which is kind of, kind of like against the social norms to use that, or like so that kind of video tapes of like war kind of stuff and guns. So why did you decide to use that? I understand that you saw kind of like a dream that you want to use that um, dancing kind of line of the people. But why you decided to use that tape when there was so, such a like big connection for like war and stuff, which was going on, or like which is going on? Well, that's a good question. I mean, um, I mean, the film touches not only on war but on, um, you know, 
let's say, r racist things, uh, anti-feminist things. I mean, it touches on a lot of issues that are, in a way, the issues that we're dealing with these days. I mean, it's been longer than these days, but right now, there, if you watch the news and you watch stuff on YouTube, it, everything, so many things have to do with that. Um, now, you, if I understand you, you may be saying that because the atrocities of this and the horrors of this war that's going on, then wh why would I use it in a film? Is that what you're? Yeah, and I think the film overall it was like making me laugh oftentimes, and it was like kind of fun. So it was kind of weird that there is this kind of cake inside the film when there is at the same time there is going a war and it causes a lot of horror and you know like scare people seeing that kind of stuff. Well, I don't really have an answer. Also, I was thinking of the gap, you know, because the gap is also, it's a negative thing. I mean, it's like when something breaks, then there's a gap. Um, so I guess what we're t talking about a little bit is negativity, negative things. How do you deal with negative things, or also I would say, how do you deal with political things or race, racist things or whatever, without turning into this authority of a documentary film? I mean, I'm not sure that I've fully, you know, because this is not an essay; it's a film art thing. But um, <coughs> yeah. Yes. It opens up, I mean, the questions that you pose that it seems like this dialogue just continues to open up these questions. But for me, I was always kind of struggling with this age-old idea of, like, they're not pedagogical in the documentary sense, like Blah Blah's men doing Shoah, and trying to deal with some kind of collective um, tra trauma, whether it be Arala or Renee, like that they're attempting to do something pedagogically. However, it's like, it begs the question if what, that can we philosophize with film? Because I, did, I don't know if it's just my kink, but, I, but I'm, like, I'm like watching the first film and I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, What's, were you reading Lacan or Wittgenstein? I'm like, who the hell was he reading? You know. Well, in the or, early things, um, I was influenced a lot by um, phenomenology. Mm -hmm. Heidegger and that mm -hmm. stuff. I mean, that's what I was going to say about the middle one. I was just kind of like, what are we tapping? It was very like, are we are we tapping Heidegger's pre-conscious here? You know, and it would it made me start thinking a little bit about the series John Berger ways of seeing, mm -hmm. where I think he shows Futwanger to conducting. He's talking about this gap between like our ideas of high art and Bar political barbarism right. and how sometimes it is, you know, the one is used to cover up the other one. Yeah. There, there's double, I mean, uh, what I call sometimes avatars, that there are characters <coughs> in the films that have, uh, are related <coughs> to other characters as a kind of double. And um, uh, Fort Fengler in that film is a little bit of an avatar of me. And there are avatars that are anti-avatars of me, like in the first film where the guy is giving the speech in a made-up language is a kind of um, spoof on a professor or authority or something doing it. So um, Fort Flanger is also a kind of double of Heidegger who a lot of his philosophy is really very important to me, has been, but he was even more implicated in the Nazi thing than um, uh, Ford Feiner. I mean, the relationship of philosophy to film is interesting. I mean, to me, the philosophy in some way comes out of it. Like one, one of the things that I I'm saying now, and I say it in the book a lot, is that my 
accepting of material is often very naive and very simple. And it's only when I get into structuring it. And then I'm amazed that something is so Here's what I was thinking, let's say, even in a film like Fogline, uh, where I had to set up a camera image um, almost instantly. You know, I didn't have hour after hour of setting it up. I just had to put up the tripod, move it around, accept that. Now, how does it happen that the implications of that less than a moment has followed me for my whole life? Um, and not follow me in a dead way, but it keeps being having new implications and new implications. And so one can say that there's a kind of philosophical side to it, but that came afterwards. Uh, it's often the decisions are happenstance. It's just like the dream, like, it just seems like there's an attempt at getting into something at some kind of. I don't know what I'm trying to get at, but I'm trying to get at something in some kind of discursive, systemic way. But at the same time, I kind of recognize that I can. But it always kind of doesn't. It exceeds my grasp. Well, I'm ha of course, the, um, in all of these films, the things that actually are worked on are um, cinematic elements. I mean, it's funny because it's hard to talk about them, you know, for me, but sometimes it's months of really um, intense labor to make this cut match that and do this or that. I mean, the, the actual kind of p intricate work on making a film. Um, but that's, and that's really an important part of our experience, and that's what I'm actually working on. But then all of those things happen to have, or not just happen, but they have philosophical implications so that they can, um, I think sometimes of it as a cognitive thing, that is the cognitive part of your mind is what leads you to interpret something or to ask a question about something, whereas a lot of the times when I watch the films, I'm just delighted in the actual visual phenomenon of it. And, and so I don't, want, I don't want the films to become the opposite of what, it, of what I want. They're not didactic. My question is about uh, natural selection. Since the footage was shot by students, could you tell us uh, instructions <coughs> that you gave to students? But also, uh, could you tell us about the editing process? Okay. Um, Thank you. Well, during this long period of time, there was this material that you see the material, actually, what there is. So what happened, and sometimes I had some influence on them. I think the fact that there's a whole theme of glossolalia happened to be that I was interested in language and we were talking about language. And then somebody who was a graduate student in another department said that she had heard this lecture by this uh, guy in, in um, Montreal who was an expert on glossolalia. And that led to corresponding with him. And then we all went to Montreal and filmed uh, that, that stuff. So each element had some element of um, leading to a filming of it or performing of it where I didn't do that. I mean, I, I had to give a little bit of instruction that was uh, technical and so on because these people were using this camera for the first time and so on. But uh, it, it was a kind of giant problem is that all this material was going in all these different directions. And then uh, it came the summer, and they all left for the summer. And it was left to me to kind of figure out some way of making one single thing out of this work. And um, one, one of the things that I felt was very important was for me to use their material in a way that was um, harmonious with what they were doing 
uh, not imposing um, my own thing quite on that material, but letting a lot of it even have length. Like some of the scenes now seem to me too long. Um, you know, like the scene in that uh, empty warehouse where they're throwing stuff out the window and so on. Um, I wrestle with that even now because um, on the one hand, it's, it's real. In other words, they were, improv you know, they were just in the room and they had to figure out what they wanted to do. So all of that of throwing the stuff out the window and then the guy climbing out of the window was, um, I had to, I felt I had to honor that and include it. And putting it in the context that it is, it takes on different associations, but it's still there footage. I added a lot of sound, uh, the stuff with Scherger, of course, but even the thing about Darwin was not part of what th they were, th we were thinking of when we were filming it. Um, so all of that stuff was put in by me. Um, um, th there, there's other sound piece elements that um, are hard to understand a little bit, but there's something about it. In, in Beethoven's house in Bonn, uh, where there's this piano that was his piano. So I included that. And so I suppose that I was adding material to their material and organizing their material um, and, as I did. I think that it was natural because um, this Swiss um, Austrian artist, uh, Alphonse Schilling, who actually uh, was here as a visiting uh, teacher for some short time, and we became friends. And a lot of his work had to do with um, visual, visual experience. And so he had this idea of constructing these wooden objects that would allow him, inside of them, to, um, to see the world as though your eyes were not how our eyes are usually. Like, for example, if your eyes were this far apart rather than this far apart, or and other things like that. Um, so uh, through me, that was all introduced into the film. But again, when they were filming, they were free to film it however they wanted to. But it was very, it was a very difficult complex editing things. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, a natural selection to me seemed to have a very literary element in the way it was structured. Like the structure of it seemed like almost literary cinema, the dividing of chapters and the focus on language right. and, and stuff like that. And I think that that goes through all of them. Yes. Um, and I'm, I was wondering, so it seems to come out of an appreciation of both cinema and literature. I, to me. In, in terms of the repetition and the cycling of the repetitions, I'm just wondering about the, the process of determining the, the, the overall amount or time. Like, is it emotive or cognitive, or is it some combination of the, you know, because like entanglement, I think, has six chapters, but maybe you could have 12 or right. four. And I'm just wondering how that that process gets worked out, because that's interesting to me, yeah. the number of times of repetition and the way they affect memory. Yeah. Well, there's two sides first to say that um, uh, I had studied music and literature before I uh, um, was be becoming a filmmaker. Uh, and the closest thing that I was thinking of was painting. And I was embarrassed about my connections with literature. I felt like, wait a minute, a lot of the filmmakers that were so powerful, they seem to be coming from the world of visual art and not from the world of literature. So I kind of stifled that, but it kept coming out. So finally, I felt, felt I'm proud, I'm glad that I had that experience and that element in, in the work. Um, and they're all about language. And even one of the things in uh, Not Not, 
is the, t the subtitles and the diagrams. There's so, and the, you know, there's so many different ways that language enters into it. Now, as far as the repetition, I think one, one idea was just that you would realize that you're not the same person when you're seeing the second go through as you were in the beginning. So memory would have a kind of special way of working there. Um, th th there's a little bit of a difference in that those shots of me saying, where am I, are different in the repetition than in the first part. Otherwise, everything's exactly the same. But the idea of what is the same is itself a pretty deep concept. This is great, you're making me work hard. <laughs> yes? Yeah, um, well, I thought it was a really great screening, so thank you for showing that first. And then um, on the first question, you're talking about from fog line, the ideas of the world of mind and the contrast between the world of fog. And I was um, wondering if there's anything I had to say about the world of fog, I guess, and it's just something I was constantly thinking of in Not Not, and I guess the relationship of this to the superimpositions and these qualities of like density and uh, opacity and how those really uh, interact both visually and with this even concept of ambiguity and how that could yeah. function both. Well, even language. the title, Not Not, I mean, yeah. I like my titles, and they have a lot of. Um, importance, you know, they're really part of the film, not something about the film. Um, so not, not has both the idea of the not and of the negativity and all of that stuff. Um, but there was something more important. Say it again. Um, so the, oh, just the, I guess to bring it down, you're talking about the world of fog. You know, oh, right, talking, okay, that's right. Yeah, that and okay. superimpositions, especially, and not how it's where I yeah. saw a large well, connection there visually. Um, some things just to say about that, although it's huge, so I can't say yeah. so much and just leave it be like it is in the film, but line seems to be um, a certain kind of definition of something. Like when you, in fog line, um, by the way, I have this, DVD, which you might want, um, but um, the, the trees uh, slowly come into greater visibility as the fog lifts, but they themselves are like um, a certain kind of ambiguous shapes, so, so that they don't, they're not something that, that would be, have a drawn line around them that's filled out in color. But as they become clearer, they still contain this um, vagueness in, in a certain way. Um, then I have, so then I can think about this contrast between fog and line in many different ways. Of course, in that film, the line is, um, is a construct of human you know, electricity, or telephone, whatever. Um, of course, the trees are also um, cultivated, like ancient times, this was like a very crowded woods, but now there's a road, you know, there's fences, there's stuff, uh, but in a certain way, there is that contrast, which follows me, and I, I never can come to the end of it. <coughs> and I certainly wasn't thinking of it so clear, like when I first had fog line, um, some people would call, would I think it was called with one continuous fog line. And then I had to think, wait a minute, it's really important that it's fog line. Like not, not. Wow. It's work to think. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Larry. And also, I would like to mention again, uh, we do have DVDs. 
for sale. So if you are interested in purchasing uh, DVDs, uh, please come down. And thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And thank you so much.